So let's talk a little bit about health maintenance in the patients uh, with IBD. Patients with IBD do not receive preventive services at the same rate as general medical patients. We have to realize that as physicians, nurse practitioners, PAs, treating a 21-year-old with inflammatory bowel disease, they often see their GI team uh, as their primary care provider. And we clearly need to set <coughs> responsibility limits with the patient and delegate routine healthcare issues to the primary care team. So for example, I will not fill prescriptions for antihypertensives and things of that nature. That has to go to their primary care provider. However, we do need to offer guidance on the unique health maintenance needs of patients with inflammatory bowel disease, especially those on immunomodulators and biologic agents. And I would argue that certain health maintenance tasks such as vaccinations be the responsibility of the treating gastroenterologist. We're, pres we're prescribing these medications. We know about the potential side effects of the medications. Therefore, maybe vaccinations is something that we should be involved with. So why are the initial visits with a patient with IBD so important? Well, if you look at the most recent data, as many as 70% of IBD patients require immunosuppressive therapy at some time in their course. So with three out of four individuals going to be immunosuppressed, those initial visits are crucial to be able to do a checklist and we'll give you some examples to bring them up to date with their vaccination. So why do we need to vaccinate these patients? Well, again, the agents that we use to treat them put them in increased risk for infections. There have been multiple case reports of infections, including fulminant hepatitis and fatal varicella. And what we do know is that the risk of infection increases with the number of immunosuppressive therapies. So for example, someone on steroids, a thiopurine and anti-TNF is going to have higher risk of developing an infection than someone who's on monotherapy, let's say with an anti-TNF or vetalizumab. Several, but not all of these vaccine, uh, these uh, disorders are vaccine preventable. IBD patients like other patients on immunosuppressive therapy are not being vaccinated appropriately, but I really wanna point out that we're doing much better. I don't think when we began this, this area of research 10 years ago that we would see any comment in the chart other than perhaps testing for uh, tuberculosis and hepatitis B in patients beginning um, uh, uh, an anti-TNF. But now in my referral practice here at Mayo, we certainly see in the notes that you are sending to us here at Mayo, comments about vaccination and your recommendations for vaccination. So let's look at some specific infections. I'm gonna concentrate on herpes zoster. Um, this was a study of over 100,000 patients with inflammatory bowel disease. And what they did was they matched patients with inflammatory bowel disease uh, to non-inflammatory bowel disease patients. And then they looked at specific therapies. And what you see here is that patients on biologics have a 1.81 risk of developing herpes zoster, thiopurines 1.85, corticosteroids 1.73. And if you add a thiopurine and an anti-TNF, what you're seeing is a risk, an odds ratio of 3.29. And if you just want to look at some of the actual numbers uh, per 100,000, 670 individuals, actually, just look at the Crohn's because those are the more important ones, 814 uh, patients compared to 426 per 100,000. So again, almost a twofold risk in patients with Crohn's disease in terms of developing herpes zoster. So when should you obtain a vaccine history? Basically, the ideal time to obtain the vaccine history is during the initial office visits. Patients should be vaccinated prior to starting immunosuppressive therapy, if at all possible. And this is a key point. If you do not offer vaccinations in your office, just write a prescription and have your patient take it to their local pharmacy. And I'll show you some data on that. And if you're in the situation, however, that you've got a sick patient and they're not immune, let's say, to um, hepatitis B, or they're not immune to varicella, you know, basically treat their IBD and we'll come back later to deal with their vaccinations because in some situations you have to wait four weeks after giving a live vaccine before you can immunosuppress the patient. And that's certainly not in the patient's best interest if they're sick and need therapy. So let's walk through vaccinating IBD patient. I told you earlier about really who's in charge. This was a study we did way back in 2010 of 109 gastroenterologists. And 
Only 50% of the GI providers at that time were asking about vaccinations always or most of the time. And there were poor knowledge regarding the appropriate vaccinations. They also didn't know which ones to give, whether the patient was immunosuppressed or not. And here at that time, we felt it was up to the primary care provider uh, to determine which vaccination should be given and to give the vaccine itself. But interestingly, an article came out around the same time that showed, and this was of primary care providers, showed that only 30% of them felt comfortable coordinating vaccinations for the immunosuppressed IBD patients. So we're in a situation where the patient um, does it well. We as, a, as the GIMD think the primary care provider should be responsible and the primary care provider is saying, I'm really not comfortable deciding what to do. I was fortunate enough to publish this paper in, in the American Journal of Gastroenterology in January, 2017. It's the ACG clinical guideline on preventive care and probably three quarters of that guideline deals with vaccinations. So it's a good resource. Um, this comes out every uh, year in February in the Annals of Internal Medicine. And sure enough, yesterday, the most recent 2021 version came out. I haven't had a chance to read it. I don't suspect we'll see many changes as it relates to the regular vaccines, but this is the recommended adult immunization schedule. And that's a free download from the ACIP or the Annals of Internal Medicine website. So IBD is for the most part rare before the age of five. So most of our patients have received all their childhood vaccinations. So we as adult gastroenterologists need to think about hepatitis A and B, HPV, influenza, pneumococcal vaccine series, shingles and varicella. But in reality, the ones that I deal with in my practice are hepatitis B, influenza, pneumococcal and shingles. I ask about HPV vaccine and, and I, but I don't specifically give that vaccine. Now, one of the first questions that come up is will the vaccine work or worsen the IBD? We have data that shows there's a diminished immune response in patients on anti-TNFs alone or with immunomodulators, but we don't see that with betalizumab. And absolutely positively no evidence to suggest that we're going to make the patient's inflammatory bowel disease worse if we vaccinate the patient. So this is a paper that I was involved with that was presented at the ACG and it's been submitted for publication. Some colleagues from the University of Massachusetts wanted to do um, a literature search, a systematic review and meta-analysis of the incidence of adverse events and IBD flares among uh, vaccinated patients. And what we found were over almost 2,500 articles. And then we specifically looked for criteria and we found 13 that met our criteria. And the analysis was done on 2,116 patients. And we had 10 studies that reported local adverse events and the pooled incidence was about 24%. And that's exactly similar to what you see in studies in non-IBD patients. If you look at systemic adverse reactions, they're mostly mild. So the local adverse reaction would be pain and swelling at the injection site. Systemic adverse reactions would be fever, flu-like illnesses, and things of that nature. Uh, there were no hospitalizations as a consequence of the vaccination, no deaths. And the overall incidence was about 16%. And that, again, is fits with um, the background incidence that you would see in patients with, uh, without IBD. And when we specifically looked at increased disease activity, we found about 2%. Clearly, again, in, uh, if you look at particular rates of relapse, this is consistent with the rates of relapse for patients. So we can reassure our patients that reactions will be the same as if they don't have IBD and a very, very low chance of um, leading to an exacerbation of their IBD. So I told you about the Annals of Internal Medicine article. This is basically what you'll see. Um, I'm concentrating on the adult, not the pediatric. And what it does is it breaks down the disease, uh, or sorry, breaks down the vaccines by the age of the individual with yellow, meaning everyone should reach to receive the vaccine. And that would be something like influenza vaccine. Uh, purple, if they have an additional risk factor. So for example, for pneumococcal vaccine, 
they want an additional risk factor. And one of those risk factors, by the way, is inflammatory bowel disease. So this is a very useful resource. And I'm going to concentrate, though, in a few slides on the group of individuals who are immunosuppressed. Now, everyone's familiar with the standard hepatitis B vaccine, but you may not be familiar with this new vaccine. It's really not that new anymore. This is a two-dose vaccine that was approved in November 2017. And unlike the standard hepatitis B vaccine, which is given at zero, one, and six months, this is two doses given at zero and one month. So it's a much more rapid development of immunity. It's a yeast-derived vaccine that has an adjuvant in it that allows it to stimulate the immune system over a shorter period of time. And if you looked at this in a head-to-head -head study, those individuals receiving the new hepatitis B vaccine, and this is non-IBD patients, their seroprotection was 95% versus 81.3%. And that's 95% after two doses versus 81% after three doses. Uh, if they looked at immune-mediated adverse events, again, flare of disease activity. You can see that these rates were very, very slow, very, very low. <clears throat> and although there are no published studies, we're in, we've been using this vaccine for the past two years here at Mayo, and we presented some data. We've submitted it for publication um, to DDW. We'll see if that's accepted and a manuscript is being uh, put together. Basically, this vaccine is uh, effective in patients with IBD who are immunosuppressed. Let's talk a little bit about Shingrix vaccine. As you know, this is approved for adults 50 and older. It's two doses given uh, at day zero and then two to the six months later. Many of you know that there was a national shortage of this vaccine for a long time. All that now has been taken care of. You can certainly get a shingles vaccine without any concern that it's on back order. Now, this data that I'm showing you is in non-IBD patients. Look at the efficacy of this vaccine at 3.2 years with a mean follow-up. Vaccine efficacy was 97.2% effective, okay, compared to placebo. So you're going to prevent all but 3% of episodes of uh, shingles in patients who receive the two-dose vaccine. Now, this vaccine, uh, we'll talk a little bit later about the mRNA vaccines, uh, this vaccine, uh, a large number of people, look at this, three out of four develop pain, uh, one out of three develop redness, one out of four develop swelling. And so these patients, because of the adjuvant, you have to warn them that one in five patients will develop a flu-like illness, shivering, fever, but that um, they're short-lived 24 hours worth of symptoms. So the vaccine was approved and then the ACIP came out and made recommendations. They met in 2017. They basically said it is recommended for the prevention of herpes zoster for immunocompetent individuals greater than 50. We use it in all our patients. Uh, they basically said, even if you had received the live vaccine in the past, you should still receive the new vaccine. Um, at that point, they recommended using the vaccine over the live one, but now that this vaccine's available, the live vaccine is no longer available in the United States. And again, if your individual, if your patient said, I had shingles in the past, they should get the vaccine anyway. And if they said they had the Zostervax, which is the live vaccine, they should get this anyway. We did a study looking at the safety of this vaccine uh, in patients with IBD. We gave the vaccine between February 2018 and July 2019 to 67 patients who received at least one dose, 55 received two, dose, two doses. You can see the follow-up, it was short. We saw no cases of herpes zoster. Rates of adverse events were uh, basically similar to the background that you see in non-IBD patients. We had one person who flared overall 1.5% several days after the second dose. And again, uh, with a very low rate of flaring, I think that's background incidence of flaring. So now let's concentrate our immunocompromised patients from that same table in um, the Annals of Internal Medicine. So again, red is not recommended, yellow is recommended for everyone, and then purple, you need a risk factor. So obviously we do not give the live 
uh, intranasal flu vaccine to immunocompromised patients, but we do use the standard vaccine. Measles, mumps, rubella, uh, varicella vaccine are not recommended for someone who's immunosuppressed. Now, the zoster vaccine, we don't have to worry, the live one, we don't have to worry about it anymore because it's no longer available. So, and then when we come to the PCV13 and uh, pre, uh, that's Prevnar and Pneumovax, you can see that <clears throat> once you get to this group here, yellow, if you're immunocompromised, it is recommended. Again, I would argue that IBD patients are immunocompromised from their illness. And so we give Prevnar to an 18 year old, to a 25 year old, regardless <coughs> um, of whether they're on immunosuppressive therapy, because again, I told you three out of four of them will go on immunosuppressive therapy at some point. Now, there's different levels of immunosuppression. You have to realize there's low level immunosuppression. So individuals who are on a methotrexate that we use or azathioprine uh, on a short course of prednisone, low dose under 20 milligrams, that's considered low level immunosuppression. However, individuals on anti-TNFs, rituximab, which we don't use, and those patients who are malnourished, those are considered high level immunosuppression. Now, what are some of the barriers to vaccination? Well, there's general apathy among both patients and physicians. <clears throat> Again, I think that the data I just showed you should alleviate any concerns about the side effects. Now, if you're in private practice, I certainly understand having a refrigerator in which you have to monitor the temperature is not realistic. So, in small practices, it's not realistic to be able to administer vaccines. Now, obviously you're already busy taking care of the patient to have to now deal with discussing uh, vaccines it can be a challenge. Um, so there are a number of different challenges. So this is my solution for each and every one of you. Um, <clears throat> this is a study we did several years ago. We surveyed seven pharmacies that account for 90% of the total prescriptions in the United States. So things like CVS and Walgreens and things of that nature. And what we basically found is that they stock the vaccines we want to give and they are available on Saturday morning early. They're available on Friday evening after hours. <clears throat> so we think the way that you can deal with vaccinations, unless you're in an academic center such as mine, would be to just write a prescription and tell the patient to go to their local CVS to get their shingles vaccine, their Shingrix, or go to their local CVS or Walgreens and get their pneumococcal vaccine. Now, if you have someone and they're a captive audience, you can give any number of vaccines simultaneously. So you can give the flu vaccine, the hepatitis B vaccine, and the pneumococcal vaccine at the same time if the patient's up to it. The only vaccines that you can administer at the same time are Prevnar and Pneumovax. They have to be separated. And with the COVID vaccines, the COVID vaccines have to be admitted separately. And they no vaccine should be given two weeks before or two weeks after. Not that there's any danger of giving them, but they want to be able to track side effects from the vaccines and giving two at the same time, you may not know what the side effects are from. Again, don't defer just because multiple vaccines are needed. You know, all live vaccines, and again, this is really not a big issue for adult gastroenterologists, can be given at the same time. And these are a number of um, kind of strategies that you can use to try to increase immunization in your practice. So for example, you can use the EMR to send messages out in, in August to say flu season is coming, uh, you need to come and get your vaccine. Or you can use the EMR to identify patients who are on steroids or immunomodulators and say, hey, you have not received the pneumococcal vaccine uh, why don't you come in and get it? So the EMR can be a very useful resource to try to uh, get your patients vaccinated. The best of all worlds is to have a vaccine advocate, someone who's in charge. It could be the medical assistant basically saying, hey, do you want to get your flu vaccine today? Or have you had your pneumococcal vaccine? And often savvy patients know about the vaccines and you can use that as an opportunity to get them referred. <clears throat> Many of you <clears throat> excuse me, are aware of um, this checklist. This checklist comes from Cornerstones, excuse me. 
And this uh, has many different things that we do for our IBD patients. So up here is vaccine preventable illnesses, bone health, cancer prevention. And again, this is the, um, the site for you to download this checklist. Again, if you drill down, it talks about varicella, shingles vaccine, measles, mumps, rubella, influenza, HPV vaccine, you know, give it, gives the dates and the like. Another checklist that you can download from, comes from the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation. Again, this is the link and it has on one page all the different vaccines, which patients do you need to check a titer beforehand and how often. So for the non-live influenza vaccine, everyone's eligible, no need to check a titer and you give it annually. And then this is a similar checklist for pediatric patients. Uh, again, we've been interested in this area for a long time. So this is a number of different articles that I've been involved with, with my colleague, uh, Dr. Freddie Caldera from the University of Wisconsin. This is in the American Journal. This is in uh, Clinical Gastroenterology and Hepatology. Uh, this just came out in Gastroenterology and Hepatology. And this just came out again in Clinical Gastroenterology and Hepatology on what you should know about COVID vaccines. So let's kind of switch over and start talking about COVID vaccines. This is the way that the CDC and the government had hoped. Uh, the first, about 12 million individuals who are critical healthcare workers and other workers. And then the next rollout would be high risk population. You know, that would be individuals above the ages of 65, 70 or 75, depending on the state you live in and then ultimately the general population. So this is a kind of a cool thing. Um, this basically is a map that shows that here in Florida, um, if you're 65 and older, you can get the uh, COVID vaccine, same thing for Texas. But in other states like New Mexico, the vaccine really at, you know, as of February 4th was only being given to individuals who are 75 or older. But if you just go to the CDC website, what you do is you click on this link, you put in your state, and then it tells you who should get the vaccine and where you can get the vaccine. So where do we stand? This is as of yesterday, 34.7 million people have received at least in the United States, at least one of the COVID uh, vaccine, their first dose, and 11.2 million have been fully vaccinated. And again, you can look here, the darker color means a higher percentage of the population have been vaccinated. So here in North Dakota and South Dakota, we're getting close to 10 or 11% here, Virginia, West Virginia, 10 or 11% of the population have already received uh, at least one shot of the vaccine. We are getting better. Um, this, this is when the, uh, the the Pfizer vaccine was approved, and this is seven day rolling average. Again, this is data from yesterday. Um, you can see that we're now at about 1.5 million doses administered per day, which is very, very good news. So I mentioned this earlier to you, do not uh, administer, co-administer the COVID vaccine with other vaccines. Uh, Vaccination should be offered to persons regardless of a history of prior symptomatic or asymptomatic COVID infection. I'll be talking a little bit more about this in a later slide. Immunocompromised individuals may still receive the COVID vaccine if there's no contraindication. And again, we do need to um, counsel patients that we don't have a lot of data on immunocompromised patients and they may have a blunted immune response. So again, should, should someone who recovered from COVID get a, a vaccine? And the bottom line is we don't know how long natural immunity will last. And in the absence of knowing how long it should last, the recommendation is that uh, you vaccinate people who have recovered. And it used to be, they would say, well, wait 90 days. Right now, if you have a healthcare worker that develop COVID in July, and here we are, and they're still a healthcare worker, they should receive the vaccine because they're a high risk for exposure. Now, 
this is coming up all the time. I'm sure you're seeing this in your office. You know, should I vaccinate my immunosuppressed patient? And the answer is absolutely yes. They should receive a COVID vaccine. Um, you know, it's also recommended for all individuals, like for example, after liver transplant. Uh, we, what we don't know is how long the, um, how long the protection will last, but we'll get that answer in the next couple of months as we do studies on these patients. But any, any protection is better than no protection. Another question is, well, you know, I just got my infusion of infliximab, of, adalib, of, my, of vetalizumab, do I need to wait? Well, you know, right now, you don't have the luxury of picking and choosing when you're gonna get the vaccine. It's gonna come whenever you're on the list. And if you just received an infliximab infusion and two days later they say the vaccine is available, you should take the vaccine, okay? Don't try to time it. And again, we do think that there may be some blunting, especially those individuals who are highly immunosuppressed. You're getting calls from patients. Well, you know, I was told I can get the Moderna vaccine. It's two shots, but it's mRNA. Should I wait for um, the J&J &J virus vaccine? And the answer is, at this point, if your patient is offered the vaccine, if you are offered the vaccine, my recommendation is to get whatever vaccine they can offer you. This is an interesting uh, picture that was taken here in Florida in May of this past year. And uh, you know we need to deal with the fact that some individuals are going to be hesitant to receive the vaccine. They're worried that this was developed too quickly. Are there some potential risk? And so Tom Frieden, who was the director of the CDC from 2009 to 2017, said COVID-19 is the first disease to have an anti-vaccine movement even before it had a vaccine. And that's truly the case. And these individuals really um, were completely against considering all types of vaccine. And this was more related to childhood vaccine. So again, why do we see vaccine hesitancy? Well, obviously uh, this has become politicized. A lot of people are worried about what the government's uh, role and have they moved things along too fast? Uh, have there been shortcuts? And then huge problem with social media uh, misinformation as it deals with this. So we need to acknowledge that there are concerns on our patients and we need to reassure them based on the data that I just presented to you. This was just released by the ACG a couple of days ago, you know, talking about facts and myths. And this is something there's the link you can go to. And we have a list of facts and myths. Again, the goal is to fight the myths with facts. Um, I personally tell my patients that I received the vaccine. I was very anxious to receive it. I'm happy that I received it. I had a sore arm, but a sore arm is, is well worth tolerating compared to getting COVID, especially for myself, who's above the age of 60. So again, we do need to uh, be strong advocates. Multiple studies have shown that uh, recommendation from the healthcare provider is highly associated with successful uh, receipt of vaccination. So again, you need to really uh, encourage your patients to get vaccinated. I'm going to give you a couple of take-home points, and then I really did want to leave a lot of time for Q&A. Uh, patients with IBD have poor immunization rates, so ask about vaccination status. In the best of all worlds, we wanna vaccinate prior to initiation of immunosuppressive therapies, but even if your patient is on immunosuppressive therapy, they should be vaccinated. Um, patients can mount a response to vaccines, but immunogenicity may be diminished, especially in individuals on combination therapy of an immunomodulator and an anti-TNF. IBD disease activity will not be affected by vaccination. We do need to take responsibility to vaccinate your patients with IBD or make explicit recommendations to the PCP. What I would write here now is just go ahead and if you don't give the vaccine in your office, go ahead and send them to their local pharmacy. Don't try to get the PCP involved because they may not store vaccines and they're just as busy as you are with, you know, with appointments that may be three months in advance and the patient can just go to their local pharmacy tonight after you saw them today. 
I encourage you to use checklists that I, I gave you examples of to increase and monitor vaccination rates. Get vaccinated yourself and encourage your staff to do so. Uh, this is me in my white, my lab coat that I wear here uh, with my little, my little pin says vaccine save lives. I don't really do very much on Twitter, but this was me getting my vaccine and my daughter helped me put that up on uh, my Twitter handle. So thank you very much. Uh, I'm gonna ask people to <coughs> unmute um, and either use the chat box and I'm happy to take any questions. So let's see, okay. So Katie, um, so I do see some questions from Vanessa. Here in Florida, even with the script, the pharmacy will not give Prevnar 13 or Numavax to anyone under 65. What, what I would do on that prescription, if you write it, is say patient is immunosuppressed, or I would say patient has a condition that is immunosuppressive. Patient has Crohn's disease and is immunosuppressive, immunosuppressed, or patient is on uh, prednisone and is immunosuppressed. Or, and so that's the way I would uh, try to deal with that issue. And I think you'll be successful um, in, in that scenario. Why don't we open up the floor for questions? Feel free to use the chat or um, if you're comfortable, you know, you can just unmute yourself and ask any questions. We have 10 minutes. I'm sure you're all getting questions from your patients about the COVID vaccine and is it safe? And, and again, I'm hopefully this has brought you up to date on on things that you can do to be an advocate for vaccination. Um, I am excited that um, there's information in the New York Times that the CDC is going to try a new uh, rollout to regular pharmacies here in Florida. The public's pharmacies are starting to give vaccines. So um, hopefully that 1.5 million will go to 2 million and issues with, um, with uh, the uh, delivery of vaccines will be dealt with with more vaccines coming. Again, according to the newspaper, um, the government signed a deal to get 200 million more doses. And so it said that by April or May, if you want a vaccine, you'll be able to get a vaccine. And then what we need to do is work and try to encourage those individuals who have not received the vaccine to, to get it so that we get to that 75 or 80% that we need for herd immunity and get back to some, some degree of normalcy. Uh, 